Okay, so now we're going to talk about trust. Given the three ways that we move the world, uh, predation, cooperation, and parasitism, and that cooperation reaps the most benefits, and also given that cooperation requires a certain degree of trust, and all we mean by trust is the, is the suspension of our instinct to defend um, <clears throat> long enough for that we, so that we can uh, uh, cooperate together. There's a number of things that go into trust. You can think of suspension as, uh, uh, of defense as incurring a cost. This is a bit counterintuitive. What we're incurring as a cost is the opportunity to betray the trust and steal from the person. If we, if we, if we take on that opportunity cost, we, in other words, we don't seize the opportunity to steal from somebody, we maintain uh, conditions for cooperation to continue. So I want you to consider for a moment that you're paying that cost constantly. As you walk down the street and you don't mug that person, you're incurring an opportunity cost to not get his stuff for free. If you walk down the street and there's a car running, uh, double parked and running on the side of the street and you don't steal that car, you're incurring the cost of having a new car for free uh, to maintain the, the, the conditions for cooperation in society. So we're taking on these opportunity costs all the time so that we can reap the benefits of living in a safe uh, and cooperative society. Uh, that, I want you to have that notion in your head that notions like Jordan Peterson saying that uh, people that are proud of Western civilization are trying to reap the rewards of their ancestors and they've done nothing for it. I would challenge that to say that we are all doing it all day long by behaving by social norms, obeying the law. We're, co we're continuously investing in, uh, in this, these conditions for cooperation all the time. So we're investing in maintaining what our ancestors created. So we're not devoid of accomplishment there. It's our accomplishment is in maintaining it. So if you incur a cost, we had mentioned elsewhere with, with property and asymmetrical benefits that incurring a cost to seek a, a benefit is an investment. So when you're engaging in peaceful, polite uh, behaviors, you're investing into something. Well, what is that that you're investing in? You're investing in a shared property of trust, what we call high trust commons. So you can consider the, the degree of trust within a community like a property and that that property has been built up over generations and generations and generations. And we've done that through things like creating manners, creating social uh, mores and social habits, uh, means of nonverbal signaling. We, we've created all of these, uh, these ways of, of testing and adapting to maintain peace, like peaceful coexistence among us. Uh, to maintain this property. So if you have somebody seizing those opportunities that the rest of us are taking as, as a cost, like stealing a car or mugging somebody on the street, they're damaging that property. They're not investing in the trust, comic, uh, trust property. They're actually vandalizing it. So if you take that a step further, the majority of so, uh, social interactions between people are geared around maintaining this trust. Even the development of language, that we speak or argue with each other in language rather than resorting to physical violence. So language becomes a proxy or a replacement or an alternative to violence. Uh, being polite to somebody is a proxy for violence. Negotiation or contract is a proxy for violence. Uh, giving somebody a cold shoulder to say that they're they're starting to impose on those trust commons is an alternative to beating them out of the head or banishing them out of the community. So that becomes a proxy for violence. So I'm going to make a, a bold assertion and say that all of human behavior that isn't predation and parasitism is a proxy for violence. It's a result of constraining our behavior to cooperation. 
that means that uh, by, by creating this property of trust and by learning the, the behaviors, the acceptable behaviors in our society, by following the laws, that allows us to cooperate at scale, at the size of a civilization. And then we all reap the rewards of that. We reap it a number of ways. Like we can walk down the street, you know, relatively at ease that we're not going to be mugged or robbed. Uh, we can go to work and earn a living and uh, uh, rather than having to, say, become a roving gang and stealing stuff. It gives us this, the, the benefits of cooperating at scale by maintaining this trust commons. So when we look at things like, um, like say culture, say Western culture, uh, or we look at things like privilege, what these really are is the, is the transactions of trust. If you've paid into the trust commons and what you gain from it. Uh, so if you're, uh, say, glorifying gang culture, uh, which is really signaling to everybody else that you value, you value the behavior that it's going to impose on a trust commons, and then people treat you differently because of it, it's not bigotry, it's insurance of the trust commons, and that we do this instinctually, and it's been ingrained into us through being raised within, within those commons uh, to maintain trust. We're monitoring this constantly through social signals, body language, tones of voice, uh, how you dress. You're, you're all signaling whether you're trustworthy or not. To what degree can I cooperate with you is what's being signaled all the time. So if you have a, a system of these, of these signals in place that has worked, that is, has built up a high, a high trust commons like what we have in the Western world. When people come in from a lower trust uh, commons, uh, there's quite often conflict between the two cultures. And part of it is because the signals are now mixed. There's confusion between the signals and some of the signals uh, on one side are, are indicative of a low trust priority. So they might accept face over truth. So lying might be rewarded within their culture or dominance play and the threat of violence is a, is a way of maintaining face that conflicts with uh, the other culture that is, uh, has this, pre uh, this uh, preoccupation with maintaining uh, trust. So naturally you have this conflict. So I'll put that into another context where 150 years ago, you know, uh, the, the British called only white Anglo-Saxon Protestants white. And then the Irish started migrating into, uh, into America and the Italians. And they had different social signals and they had different social values. And then there are frictions between these two cultures over a number of decades. So the Irish come in, they create a lot of gangs in New York. There's a lot of drinking. There's a lot of boisterousness. And over time, the conflict, what we call prejudice against the Irish, is these two trust commons readjusting their signals, telling one group that's not acceptable here, the other group saying, well, some of these things can be acceptable until they start to level off. Uh, and when it levels off uh, and, a, and an optimum is sort of maintained, then the boundary of in-group now comes out and, and surrounds the other group. So this is another word for assimilation. Assimilation is really, is really that, the, the two cultures coming to, uh, uh, to sort of an agreement of transactions to maintain the trust. Uh, so really, things like prejudice or, or, or uh, uh, bigotry can be seen as insurance of a social fabric from one group to the other. It's a transaction of signals. And then, and that by behaving according to uh, these rules, these social rules that we have, we're paying into those trust commons so that we can reap the rewards of those trust commons. And people that, uh, that are disenfranchised from that culture uh, will always have an incentive to betray the trust commons. They can resort to crime or they can resort to fraud. Uh, to offset costs and, and gain benefits. 
So we have to be aware of it all the time. And we end up uh, policing each other all the time uh, to maintain these trust comments. So the, the main takeaway is that the trust is a property. It's a property that is continuously maintained. We pay into it all of, all of the time in ways that we're not aware of uh, and we're benefiting from it uh, pretty much all the time when you live in a high trust commons. This will also give a metric on measuring the quality of a culture or a society. How conducive is it to, to, uh, to cooperation? Uh, what optimum have they reached? Some cultures will tolerate corruption or to tolerate certain degrees of fraud, uh, and they, they reach an optimum that, that is, uh, say, broader than what we have in uh, Anglo-derived cultures where we don't tolerate those things. In other cases, we offset through these proxies of violence. We kind of, we, through incremental suppression, we push those behaviors into a realm that is somewhat more tolerable, meaning that it isn't eroding the trust commons too much. Uh, and then I would say, lastly, is it's helpful to look at uh, people's behavior uh, as whether is it eroding trust commons, is it forwarding trust commons, um, or is it betraying or, or um, vandalizing trust commons. Okay, I think from there we can move on to sovereignty.